Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. A year into the COVID-19 crisis, it's clear the pandemic has affected relationships in all facets of Americans' lives, including those with the animals they love. On today's show, we are going to take a deep dive into a study that tries to answer some of the questions about how we take care of our pets during the pandemic. Even though this episode is a bit stat heavy, it is a great look into our lives with pets. From First Paw Media, sponsored by Alaska Dog Works Professional Canine Training Center in Anchorage, Alaska. This is Dog Works Radio, committed to families and their dogs to build lifelong and fulfilling relationships. Visit our website at dogworksradio.com. Now, here are your hosts, Robert and Michelle Forto. Hello and welcome to Dog Works Radio. This is Michelle Forto and I am the lead trainer of Alaska Dog Works. Here, we help owners and their dogs have a better relationship. On today's show, we are talking about a study that looked at Americans and their pets during the pandemic. A wide-ranging national poll of more than 1,300 pet owners conducted in early March by Money and Morning Consult explored not only changes to how owners interacted with their pets during the pandemic, but what they spent on them, as well as what they might be willing to spend on medical bills were the worst to happen to their animal. The study also looked at how and why Americans acquired new non-human companions during the past 12 months. Other questions covered pet owners' confidence in the vets entrusted with their medical care and owners' knowledge of pet insurance. The results revealed a deepened relationship during the pandemic between humans and their pets, reflected in part through a willingness to spend almost anything to provide for their animal's care. We also found that what Americans expect from pet insurance and what it usually delivers may often be at odds. Even today, with lockdowns lifting and vaccinations expanding, Americans continue to spend an average of at least 20% more time during the day at home than before the pandemic, according to Google's community mobility data. Holding up at home inevitably means more time with pets than was the case in the era of commuting, live events, eating out, and more. Fortunately, the trend has been mostly a positive development, the survey found. More than half of respondents said they value their pets more, 58%, and more affectionate, 50%, to them now than they were in the pre-COVID times. And at least some of those 31% and 37% respectively who reported no change in those measures may feel that way because they think in absolute terms. In other words, they couldn't value or love their pet any more than they did before the pandemic. 
Dog and cat owners reported almost identical increases in the value and affection they lavished on their animal, as did owners of purebred and mixed bred pets. Interestingly, the more urbanized the pet owner, the more likely they were to say their pet outlook had positively changed in the past year. Suburbanites had middling increases in their feelings for their pet, but those with a rural home were notably less inclined than owners as a whole to report step ups in the value. 53% versus 58% or affection, 41% versus 50%. They feel for their pets now. Urbanites, on the other hand, went in the opposite direction from the norm, averaging 61% on increased value and 64% on being more affectionate. The negatives to pandemic pet ownership were fairly minor. A minority 11% did report that their pet annoys them more now. A slightly higher but still small 16% proportion of owners reported trouble in keeping up with their pet's needs. But increased dog walking doesn't appear to be the issue here. Roughly one in five dog owners said they got help during the day before the pandemic with walking and other pet care but only one in five of that group who presumably would feel a burden now having lost their assistance said care for their pooch was more work now than when they had help. It could be that people like walks with their dog, so doing it more doesn't seem like work. But a perhaps surprising data point may also come into play. Only half of dog owners now report taking more walks with their dog now than before March 2020. We find a relationship between age and difficulty keeping up with pets' needs. The youngest pet owners, those 18 to 34 years old, were far more likely to agree that they struggled with pet care. 21% than seniors at 8%. Dogs and cats aren't being showered with expensive new snacks or playthings in the COVID-19 era based on the data. Pet owners' spending has remained steady from before the pandemic other than slight increases among the heaviest spenders. Those who rack up more than $150 a month on food, toys, and other non-medical expenses. More than two-thirds or 71% of owners said they spend $100 or less a month on their pet now and spent the same amount before March 2020. More than one in five respondents to the survey, or 22%, said they'd welcomed a new animal into their lives since March 2020. The age of the owner and others in the home made a big difference to the likelihood of becoming a new pet parent. Younger people and younger families were by far the most likely to have added a pandemic pet. Gen Zers, born between 1997 and 2012, millennials born between 1981 and 1996, and families with kids at home were all about 50% more likely than respondents as a whole to have acquired an animal since March of 2020. For many, it seems the pandemic provided the excuse they've always wanted to get an animal companionship. Since a long-time desire to get a pet topped the motivations to take the pet plunge, now with about 72% citing it. But more time, especially at home, was also frequently cited as was plain loneliness, which more than half of the respondents at 52% said was among their motivators. Shelters by far dominated the places where the new pet was acquired at 37%. That's 
unsurprising perhaps given the sustained surge in interest in so-called rescue pets during the pandemic. Buying from a breeder came next at 20%, followed closely by being gifted a pet at 17% and buying it from a pet store at 16%. Since shelters were the most popular places to get a pet, they asked Yelp, the crowdsourced rating service, to identify the place in every state that its raters had scored highest for adopting a pet. Interest in new pets has surged in the past year, according to Google data. The search terms rescue dogs and shelter dogs hit all-time traffic highs a few weeks into the pandemic and have stayed above their five-year averages ever since. Given that crush, we might have expected significant dissatisfaction with the pet buying process as sellers struggle with a crush of new buyers. Instead, overall satisfaction with the pet purchasing experience was almost as high as it could be at 95%. And there was virtually no difference in satisfaction between the different ways to acquire a pet from a shelter, breeders, or pet store. People who purchased from a pet store, though, were less likely to say they are very satisfied at 69% than those who bought in other ways. In response to the findings, Brandy Hunter, Vice President of Public Relations and Communications at the American Kennel Club, said the organization was happy to see the a vast majority of those who chose to get a dog from a breeder were satisfied. We advocate for all people to acquire a dog in a responsible, well-researched manner as adding a pet to the home is a big commitment. During the purchase experience, few buyers faced hidden or unexpected charges at 6% overall across all sources. Though 15% of purebred cat buyers did, along with 10% of those who purchased a pet from a store. Interestingly, almost as many buyers reported the need for references and or background checks from breeders at 16% and pet stores at 19% as with shelters at 20%. Pets are more than companions. They're also potential patients who receive both routine and occasional acute medical care. Three quarters of owners said they take their pet to the vet at least annually for checkups, vaccinations, and other routine care. As the American Animal Hospital Association recommends, Purebred pets and those owned by people who reported good to excellent finances were more frequent visitors to the vet. For example, nine of every 10 respondents with annual incomes of $100,000 or more went to the vet at least annually for routine reasons. Close to half of those wealthier owners at 44% visited more than once a year, which is far higher than the 25% of owners overall who did so. Conversely, only about two-thirds of those who said their financial situation was poor to fair reported making annual visits to the vet. Owners reported going to the vet for acute care far less often at 34% at least once a year. Owners with $100,000 incomes or more or who own purebred pets were again more likely to, than most to make the visits. That data could reflect the propensity of some purebreds to hereditary trouble or a greater inclination by wealthier owners to take their pet in for even minor problems or neither of those things. Respondents showed a willingness to spend big to preserve their pets' lives, while also showing some realism about those end-of-life decisions. More than two-thirds say they would take any measure to save their pet's life, regardless of cost, at 67% agreeing. And even more, at 80%, said they'd take any measure they could afford. 
Responses to these questions change predictably based on financial situations, but the effects of affluence were less than for responses to most other vet care inquiries. Other responses, though, suggested pet owners may be more hard-headed than that data suggests. Six in 10 pet owners said they'd weigh the cost of treating their pet against their finances and nearly as many, 54%, said they'd seriously consider the cost of treatments if their pet was older. And about half that proportion at 28% said they wouldn't take expensive measures to save their pet regardless of its age. There were modest age differences in these responses with young people generally showing more willingness to take any needed medical measures, but the only effect of affluence, interestingly, was that those who reported a poor to fair financial situation were little more likely to say they'd spend as needed to save their pet than were wealthier respondents. It's clear, though, that pet owners put a lot of weight in what the vet recommends in regard to care for their pet, including those when the animal is old. At least two-thirds agreed that they trusted their animal doctor not to over-treat their pet and that they'd pay for the treatment the vet recommends regardless of the pet's age. The survey provides mild support for reports that vet appointments are a little harder to get than they were pre-pandemic, perhaps due to an influx of new puppies and kittens who need shots and the like. But nearly half of pet owners at 44% affirmed in formal reports that it has become harder to snag a vet appointment than before the pandemic. Young pet owners were more likely to report that perhaps because their schedules were less flexible than older workers or retirees. Some of those who use a pet training service also reported greater difficulty in getting onto the schedules of those professionals, although to a lesser extent, with 29% agreement. Pet insurance, which is health coverage for the animals in our lives, has been among the fastest growing pet products in recent years. Sales in dollars have been growing annually by double digit percentages, according to the North American Pet Health Insurance Association. Still, only one in five or 20% of the survey respondents had insurance on their pets or had it previously. But word on this coverage has apparently spread more widely and nearly three times as many pet owners we surveyed, 56%, reported some familiarity with pet insurance. Although most of those, 39%, said they were somewhat rather than very, 17%, familiar with the product. The relatively weak familiarity may explain why, when asked about what pet insurance covers, significant majorities indicated they'd expect reimbursement for expenses that they would not or very likely would not receive under most or all policies. The relatively weak familiarity may explain why, when asked about what pet insurance covers, significant majorities indicated they'd expect reimbursement for expenses that they very likely would not receive under most policies. True, more than three in five respondents, or 76%, accurately grasped the main benefit of most pet insurance, that it reimburses at least part of a major expense above $500 in any one year. And fewer than a quarter of the respondents at 24% incorrectly uh, believed they'd be reimbursed for treatment of conditions the pet already had when it was first insured. Still many, 43% of the respondents, believed routine visits, such as for vaccinations, would be covered by a policy. That is statistically very unlikely, given that most policies sold cover only accidents and illness treatment and generally omit routine care. Almost the same proportion of owners at 39% believed they would get reimbursement for vet visits up to $500 a year when there's almost invariably an annual deductible on policies of at least $200 and no payments are made until that is met. 
Furthermore, more than a third of respondents at 38% expected they'd be spared paying for vet costs up front, as with many human health policies. But that's a rare perk with pet insurance, which almost always requires payment in advance, after which the pet owner applies for reimbursement from the insurer. Owners who currently had insurance or had it previously showed better knowledge of likely coverage. Still, the only sizable edge of 10% among policyholders, past or present, was in more accurately understanding the upfront payment provision. I know that was a lot of information, but my goodness, what an enlightening study. What do you think? Let us know in the comment section of where you are listening to the show. We're going to quickly turn it over to my co-host, Robert, to give us his mushing radio update. Hi, guys. In response to recording this on the last weekend of March, I do have a quick mushing radio update. Starting next week, the first week of April, is the Kobuk 440 race, which is the longest mid-distance race in Alaska. The spring mushing continues to be very good here around South Central Alaska, and we still have, oh, about five feet of snow on the ground and more coming this week. I don't think we've ever had this much snow this late in the year. The Iditarod coverage was a blaring success. We had 138,000 downloads this year, by far more than any other year. And just a couple of quick updates. Starting this week, we have a new series coming out. It's a three-parter on Rock on Racing, which is a profile of the Randalls family who live up here in Alaska. And coming up in three weeks, we have an interview with Jake Way of Chili Sled Dogs. And he is going to talk all about what happens to sled dogs when they retire. This question comes up so often when people ask about mushing. And it's going to be a very interesting story to hear about where some of these canine athletes go after their racing days are over. Let's go back to Michelle. Robert, thank you for that mushing radio update. You guys, this is DogWorks Radio, and we are actually a media station. So our media handle is First Paw Media, and not only do we have DogWorks Radio there, but we also have mushing radio there, as well as a couple of other little shows that you can tune into if you go to our archive. But you know what? It's time for me to take a short break. And when I come back, I'm going to talk all about our local calendar of events. We're living in uncertain times. If there is one thing we can be thankful for, that is the recent pet adoption boom. Shelters are being cleared out, and that means you may not know much about your new best friend. Alaska Dog Works virtual and on-site classes are the best way for you to build a lasting bond and learn about your pup, new or old. From setting up a proper routine to learning the commands and much more, Alaska Dog Works provides you with the resources to develop your dog into one of the best. Right now, Alaska Dog Works has an exclusive offer just for our listeners. Go to alaskadogworks.com now and use promo code DOGWORKS and save 20% off your training program at the time of your booking. Visit alaskadogworks.com and use promo code DOGWORKS to save 20% today. That's alaskadogworks.com and use promo code DOGWORKS at the time of booking. All right, guys, it's now time for our local calendar of events. For those that are listening locally on KVRF or our current and past clients, please stay tuned for some important announcements. And for our other listeners, stick around. You never know what you might learn. So as you guys heard, March is Poison Prevention Awareness Month. Be sure you get that poison control phone number and put it in your phone so you can quickly dial it if you ever have an emergency. 
March 30th is Take a Walk in the Park Day. Although not exclusively a pet holiday, this day makes a great time to explore a new park with your dog. And hey, while you're out there taking a walk in the park with your dog, why don't you take a minute and post a pic of you and your dog on our DogWorks Radio Facebook page. We'd love to see you. Coming up in April, there is a lot going on. Month-long observances for April. It is Canine Fitness Month. Look for us to do some specific shows just about that. Active Dog Month. This is a great time to check out our Adventure Dog Club. You can find out more on our website at alaskadogworks.com. It's also National Adopt a Greyhound Month in April, National Heartworm Awareness Month in April, and even though we're in Alaska and heartworm's not that big of a deal, it's still worth talking to your vet about or investigating for yourself. April is also National Pet First Aid Awareness Month. This event is an effort by the American Red Cross to draw attention to the need to know specialized pet first aid. Did you know that it is also one of our merit badges in the Adventure Dog Club too? And we also have some past episodes on DogWorks Radio all about pet first aid and emergency awareness. April is also pet, or excuse me, prevent Lyme disease in dogs month. Prevention of cruelty to animals month sponsored by the ASPCA. And it is also national pet month for our friends across the pond in the United Kingdom. In early April, we will be at the Matsu Outdoorsman Show at the Alaska State Fairgrounds in Palmer. This event is going on on April 9th, 10th, and 11th. Please come out and say hello. We love it when our listeners let us know that they've stopped by to say hi. We will also have all of our First Paw coffee blends on sale, a bunch of gear, and you can learn all about our Adventure Dog Club just in time for spring. We are also dealers for Wilderness Athlete, both human and canine products, and we will have those as well. We are excited about this one. It was canceled last year because of COVID, but this year is supposed to be bigger than ever. Not only will we be there, but there will be food trucks, live events, demonstrations, and much more. This is the premier event for anyone that is interested in getting outdoors in Alaska. So I know I'll see you there. On April 17th, we will be starting our group classes in the park. They will be held at Wonderland Park in Wasilla at 1130 a.m. These are free for our current and past clients and are part of your training package. If you are not a client or just want to check us out, this is a great way. We do have a nominal drop-in fee. We are gathering gear for our first ever nosework class and try ball and Robert is going to do pack walks again too. If you want to get an idea of what we will be doing, head on over and watch the pack on Amazon Prime Video. It's a really cool show, but it also gives you a little bit of an idea of what our Adventure Dog Club is all about too. Did you know that every Wednesday and Sunday night, I do a Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Be sure to check that out on Alaska Dog Works Facebook page. If you miss the live broadcast, you can always tune in later on on the events section. Also, stay tuned for information about the Summer Festival, how you can train your dog to run in the Alaska Dog Works Dryland Derby this fall, and much more. As always, you can keep up to date by following us on our social channels. Just search Dog Works Radio. And for more training tips and tricks and to learn how to schedule a free discovery call to talk with us about how to make your dog one of the best, visit alaskadogworks.com. And I'll see you next time.